Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Washington. One of the great success stories of a rather otherwise dismal Afghan war, dismal both for Afghans and for NATO and American forces, has been the great success of the campaign to use predator drones and cell phone technology to, with amazing accuracy, pinpoint Taliban and al-Qaeda leaders and to assassinate them without touching civilians. At least that's what we've been told. Further investigation shows perhaps this hasn't been such a great success story as we have led, been led to understand, at least for Afghan civilians. Now joining us to talk about all of this is Gareth Porter. Gareth is an investigative journalist and often contributor to the Real News Network. Thanks for joining us, Gareth. Thank you, Paul. So tell us a bit more about this story. What has what, what investigation really found in terms of how civilians are being affected by this? My investigation of this uh, question of, of just how uh, precise the targeting has been in Afghanistan by the U.S. Special Forces in their so-called night raids uh, has really focused on the way in which uh, McChrystal, General Stanley A. McChrystal, began the whole process of uh, building a system uh, for uh, targeting uh, the people that they wanted to kill or, or capture. It began in Iraq in 2006, uh, and it was there that really McChrystal built his reputation both with Washington and with the news media. And he was credited quite widely for having been uh, remarkably successful in uh, killing and capturing, uh, particularly killing, al-Qaeda uh, officials and then uh, the the uh, insurgents associated with the Mahdi army of uh, Muqtad al-Sadr. Uh, this is 2006 and 2007. And in fact, Bob Woodward even credited uh, McChrystal and his special forces outfit, the, the JSOC, the Joint Command uh, for Special Forces that operated there, with essentially uh, winning the, uh, uh, the, the war in Iraq, or at least defeating the insurgents in 2007 and 2008. Uh, in fact, we now know that, that that was really a vast exaggeration and that the Sunni and uh, uh, Shia insurgencies both uh, either collapsed or uh, drew down uh, for political reasons, not because of the success of the killings. But what I found uh, interesting about the beginnings of this system was just how completely dependent the intelligence for the targeting was on uh, cell phone uh, calls, cell phone records. Uh, what, what do we find out now is that what he was really doing was tracking cell phone calls uh, to anyone who was already a target and widening the net by adding these people who were in touch through their cell phones with the people that it already targeted. And so you would go from one target to the next, sometimes within a matter of hours. And that was OK uh, in terms of not uh, targeting civilians and, and killing or imprisoning large numbers of civilians in Iraq. But when they transferred that system then to Afghanistan in 2009, this is when the trouble really began. And that's where my story really, uh, I think, drills down to uh, ascertain just how bad the system has worked in terms of targeting civilians either wrongly or deliberately. Well, what was different about what happened in Afghanistan versus Iraq, and how did it operate in Afghanistan? What was different was that in Afghanistan, you have a society, particularly in the Pashtun South and East, where virtually everyone has in their cell phone the numbers of a few Taliban commanders, or at least one Taliban commander, who they can call up when they're in trouble, when they need help. And this is just the nature of the South, uh, South and Eastern uh, uh, Afghanistan society, where uh, the, the Taliban is deeply embedded in the, in the society, and everybody knows people in the insurgency. They're, they're friends, they're family of insurgents. And so what has happened very clearly uh, with regard to the McChrystal night raids in Afghanistan is that what they were doing was they would establish uh, a place, a particular location, a, a home or a compound, 
as a target because something had happened to draw their attention to it. And then any cell phone call that went into that location or anybody who visited that location was a suspect. And if you did it more than once, you became extremely suspicious and you probably ended up on their target list, the JPEL, the Joint Priorities Effects List, which was the targeting for, I mean, the target list for people who were to be killed or captured. Now, one of the th things you point out in your article is that th when they would go after targets that had been located over this cell phone technology, they would do kind of a sweep. And it, it wasn't like they inadvertently would sweep up civilians. It was actually part of the strategy to sweep up civilians. What's that about? Well, there are two things going on here. On one uh, side of the ledger, we know that when they went into a compound to target one person who was on their list and they found four or five or ten people, um, if they weren't women or children, basically they were packed up and, and sent off uh, to the nearest U.S. military base where the uh, interrogators would have their way with them and they would try to get some um, intelligence from these people about uh, people they knew in the insurgency, even if they weren't insurgents themselves. Uh, so, so they were sort of targets of opportunity as uh, the, the uh, night raiders arrived uh, on the scene and found them on the premises. But then another thing that was happening was that uh, at some point, and we can't really nail down exactly when this started happening, the, uh, the night raiders decided that they might as well uh, target individuals who were not believed to be insurgents themselves, but who they thought were in touch with insurgents. And again, this brings in the cell phone traffic. If they saw that there were cell phone calls from an individual to somebody who was a, an insurgent suspect, they didn't bother to find out if, if the cell, cell phone calls were from somebody who was uh, really uh, a suspect as being an insurgent. Uh, if it was a friend or a family member, they would simply decide to put them on the list to pick them up so that they could interrogate them and hopefully get intelligence. So they constantly widened the net through this uh, basically targeting of people who they knew were innocent civilians. Now, some of this is not just about capturing people for interrogation. A lot of these night missions were about assassinations and a lot of civilians are getting killed. What, what do we know about civilian deaths in the course of these night raids? Well, again, I think there are two ways in which civilians are getting killed. One of them is that they make mistakes. They target somebody who they think is a prominent mid-level or high-level uh, Taliban official, and they, they get it wrong because they're so totally relying on cell phone uh, data, cell phone intelligence, that they don't even know who this person is. And, of course, the primary Example, the best example of this is this case last September when the night raiders uh, targeted somebody who they thought was the shadow Taliban governor of Takhar province, when in fact he was a former Taliban uh, commander who had left the movement in 2001, had never gone back, and had become a human rights activist working with uh, the EU, in fact. He was vouched for by uh, Michael Semple, the former deputy EU representative in Afghanistan, as somebody who definitely was not working for the Taliban. But because his, he called this shadow governor like once a month, he knew him personally because he called him, somehow or other they got mixed up and they decided that, the, in fact, this guy who was making the calls was the shadow governor and they targeted him for assassination. And in the process, they killed nine uh, uh, people who were, tar uh, who were uh, campaigning for this guy's nephew for the uh, Afghanistan uh, parliament uh, in, the same, in the same helicopter raid. Then the other thing that happens is that uh, they go in to, to capture or kill somebody on their list and a family member comes out of a room not knowing what's going on with a weapon or even something that they think might be a weapon and they shoot him to death. Or somebody comes from a neighboring home to see what the commotion's all about, and that neighbor gets, uh, gets killed. So, I mean, we know that both of these things are happening on a pretty wide scale. So from a military point of view, their argument might be, okay, mistakes happen. Yes, there's what, you know, collateral damage, that's the term they like. Um, but on the whole, this whole night campaign thing has been effective. Is that true? Well, that's certainly the argument that they're making, no question about it. They're making it very vociferously, and of course, they're not uh, bringing up or allowing to be stated 
the other side of the picture, which is that in the process, they're whacking a lot of innocent civilians and they're imprisoning or at least incarcerating briefly thousands and thousands of civilians and disrupting uh, family life for even a larger number of civilians in the south and the east, particular, particularly of, of Afghanistan. And so really it, it is the political effect of the night raids that is the issue here, uh, apart from the unethical, immoral, and probably illegal nature of the targeting that they're actually carrying out. I mean, there, there's absolutely no argument here that uh, about the question of the hatred that these night raids and uh, both civilian casualties and the, the disruption of the privacy of the home life of so many thousands of people is causing uh, among the uh, civilian population of Afghanistan. Uh, that this is the biggest single cause of hatred of US and foreign troops in the country and indeed hatred of the United States. And in some cases we know that people be decide to become uh, full-time uh, jihadist to get back at the United States because of uh, the, the revenge factor. And this is again a tribal society in which Pashtun Wali, the, the Pashtun code of conduct reigns and in which if you kill uh, someone in a person's family unjustly, that person is obliged by that code of conduct to get back to take revenge against the people who are the killers. And we have to face the fact that this is going to go on for a generation or two. So much for winning the hearts and minds. Thanks very much for joining us, Gareth. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.